Okay, hi everybody. Thanks for coming for the talk. I'm uh, Mike Kolesnik. I'm a senior software engineer at Red Hat and a core maintainer in uh, the Overt project. This is Rene Koch. You can uh, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Rene. I work as a senior solution architect for uh, List Linux Land. Okay, and we're going to talk about uh, expanding over its horizons. So, who here knows about over it? Oh, great. So it will be a short, really short introduction for it. Um, basically, if you have any questions, I'll be happy if you save them to the end because we have uh, we are short on time. So, yeah. so let's look at uh, what we're going to talk about. So first of all, small over it introduction for those of you who don't know what is over it. And then we're going to talk about two parts. First part is how to consume over it, which is uh, just uh, getting information and acting upon over it. This is important because it's going to be used in the second one, which is how to extend over it. We have uh, VDSM hooks and the scheduling API and the UI plugins, which will be presented by Rene. So let's uh, begin. So what is over it? I guess most of you already heard about it. Uh, large scale uh, centralized virtualization. It is basically like a open source uh, vSphere or vCenter. It's based on uh, KVM. It gives us uh, KVM and Linux, give us great uh, performance and stability and uh, other features. And uh, there are a great lot of companies behind it and also individual contributors which all create over it. So basically it looks like this. We have the web admin and the main tab is the VMs tab. We also have data centers, clusters, hosts, which all comprise the physical hardware. And then we have like a network storage, all the resources and the VMs with, that we manage. It's really a featureful application. You should check it out on overit.org. So first part, how to consume all this wonderfulness. So we have uh, APIs. Basically, we have REST API, SDK, and Shell. <coughs> So basically, what can I do with these APIs? I can configure my infrastructure, like a host uh, configuration and ins installation, configure networking on the host, configure storage resources. And I can do virtual machine configurations. So basically, networking on the virtual machine, storage, and setting up different devices, setting up memory, and et cetera. Also, VM lifecycle management. Also, I can manage users. We have a very powerful uh, permission system in place. And basically, all the operations in the UI and more, because some features are not exposed in the UI, only via the API. <coughs> and the different ways to access the API. So we have <coughs> REST API is just doing calls on URLs and getting a response. Uh, SDK, which is uh, basically Python or Java SDK, just accessing it programmatically, and you get a list of uh, objects that you can act upon. And in the shell, you can just do shell commands and get a formatted text result. So we'll be talking about the API concepts. So basically, all APIs go through the Ovid engine, which is the main component, which controls everything. And all, all the APIs are built in layers. So REST API is at the bottom. Then on top of it, we have the SDKs. And basically, a shell is on top of the Python SDK. And we, have, we try to maintain backward compatibility so that if you have scripts or some programs working with the SDK or shell or the API, they wouldn't stop working when you upgrade to the next version. And we also have secure access. but because the security has to take place each time, each call, we also have session-based access, so you can get a ticket and reuse that ticket for each call. <clears throat> so let's talk about the REST API. This is the most basic, the core API that Overt Engine exposes. So basically, it's just doing HTTP methods, HTTP calls, so we have get to get a list of resources or a single resource representation. Post is to submit a new resource or to act upon an existing one, like a launch a VM via post. Put is to update a resource, or so just uh, update the representation. And delete, of course, deleting the resource. And the various media types we support, we have XML, and we have JavaScript, uh, JavaScript object notation, JSON. Uh, basically, it's mostly the same, looks uh, 
like uh, the same fields, identical fields, and you just choose whatever you want. You specify in the request which uh, media type you send, and in the response, which response you want to get. It's up to you. Uh, so let's look at an example how we do things uh, with the collections. To list all the VM resources, we just call get on the URL slash API slash VMs. To create a VM resource, we use post, HTTP post, on the same URL, and we need to specify in the body the VM that we want to create, and to act upon a single resource. So use get on the single resource. It's the same URL, VM slash the ID of the resource at the end. Uh, to update it, we do a put on the same URL with the ID, and we have patch mechanism, so you don't have to send the entire resource each time. You just send which fields you want to update. And to remove a resource, of course, just call HTTP delete on this URL. And basically, you can browse the REST API by yourself and follow the links and discover all the collections. But we also have RSDL to describe which actions you can take, what are the parameters that you can send to the API. So basically, it's always available on API uh, question mark RSDL. And it's uh, very easy to consume, especially for scripts. It's just standardized XML structure that describes the API and how to use it. So that's it about REST API. Let's talk about uh, SDK that is built on top of it. And REST API is nice, but usually you want to access it more pro programmatically if you're extending over it. So basically, it's used more for uh, integration, automation, and uh, some advanced usages. And it's object-oriented, so you just access and uh, use the objects. And current bindings we have is uh, Java and Python stable ones. And we have also libg over it and lib uh, rb over it, uh, which are less stable. And some more are planned to be supported. And what are the concepts of the SDK? So basically, complete abstraction. You don't need to know which protocol is used. You just use the SDK like uh, you would use any, any other library. You don't care that it's rest uh, behind the scenes. And it's also fully compliant with the, with the Ovid Engine API. So basically, every method that you can do, everything that you can do through REST API, you should be able to do via the SDK. And it's really self-descriptive. It's uh, descriptive. It's really easy to use. Auto-generated, of course. Uh, all the SDKs are always kept out to date because they're auto-generated. And if you have the supporting environment, you also get nice auto-completion. So like in this example, we, we look at Python SDK. So I just import the API project, uh, object in Python. And then I can create a proxy for the API. So I just give a URL, username, password, get, get a proxy object. And on that proxy object, I can list all the available uh, collections or actions. So in this case, I can call VMs. And on VMs, I can see all the actions, like add a new VM. So basically, how to add a new VM is just a few more steps. So again, we import the API and uh, create a proxy for it. But we also need to specify a cluster and the template to create a VM. So we get the cluster, we get the template, and we create a parameter of the VM that we want to create. So basically name, cluster, template, and the amount of memory. We send it to the API VM's collection. Uh, we call add, and we get back the VM object that we can further act upon, like start this VM or add disks, add, uh, res add network resources, other kinds of devices. So that's it about consuming over it. Basically, there are lots of other uh, things we can look, uh, look about, but these are the basic concepts. And let's talk about how we can use them when extending over it, because that's what we're here to talk about. So starting with VDSM hooks, so to understand what is uh, VDSM hooks, we need to understand what is VDSM. It's basically a component that runs on single hypervisor and manages that hypervisor, just manages the host and the VMs running on the host. And the hooks is just a mechanism that you can use to put scripts on that host, on that specific one host, and they alter the way that VDSM is running the VMs. 
And basically the operation of VDSM, like uh, the daemon that is managing the hypervisor. So hooks are just called uh, on specific life cycle events. We will see like the full list. And they can sometimes modify the, the, the XML structure that is sent to Livvirt because VDSM, as we can see, is using Livvirt to create, actually run the VMs. So it basically can do everything that Livvirt supports. And also hooks can run system commands. So if you want to, say, apply firewall rules before you run the VM, you can do that. You just call IP tables, whatever. And you have more information, so the first link is just a general description of the hooks, how to write, how to use. And the second one is actually a hooks catalog, all the existing hooks that are available for use that you can install on your host. And <clears throat> these are the various hook points, so basically there's a lot of them, uh, mostly VM lifecycle ones. Uh, there's also a couple like uh, VDSM when the daemon starts, when the daemon stops, and also some uh, network configuration hook that was re recently added. And uh, on VM level, you can also do either on the whole VM, create a hook that handles the whole VM, or a specific uh, VM device. So basically, currently only NICs are supported, but there should be support for other device types as well. So let's look at the VM level hook. Uh, this hook, what it actually does is uh, remove MAC uh, anti-filtering, MAC, MAC anti-spoofing rule. So basically when you start a VM, usually it will not allow you to spoof the MAC inside the VM, not allow you to use a different MAC. This hook, if you install and use it, it will allow you to use any MAC that you want on any of the devices, on the network devices. So the important parts are, there's a... Um, there's a custom parameter that is sent to the hook. There's a parameters map that is sent. We'll see where it is filled. And we check if this parameter exists, if it's, uh, if it's active. Only then we do the hook logic. So most of the hooks act like that. They don't just act automatically. They only do it if you specify some custom parameter. And then the other two lines is the read XML and the write XML. So we get the XML for the entire VM. We act upon it, we do whatever changes, changes that we want to do, and in the end we write the XML back, and this is what gets sent to Livvirt or to other hooks, because the hooks uh, can be chained up, but you don't have uh, an order of execution, so each hook basically runs uh, solo on the XML. And the custom parameter is specified in this case on the virtual machine level, so you have a custom properties uh, tab, and you can just add whatever custom properties you want. In this case, you want uh, max spoofing. So you say max spoofing, and you say true. You can also say false, and then it will obviously not run the hook. <clears throat> and per device level, you can do basically a very similar hook. So it also checks if there's some custom parameter. But the two lines that I read and write the XML, it's just for a specific device. So this is just if you want to affect a specific let's say a network interface, you just want to allow on that network interface to do max spoofing, then you can do it instead of affecting the whole VM. And to specify it, you also have a place that you specify the uh, custom parameter. So how to write a hook? Basically, you need the hook scripts. Of course, these are the scripts that do the work, do the, like the scripts that we saw, the Python scripts. And you usually uh, include a readme that says, what does this hook do, and how do I configure it, and how do I use it, how do I consume it uh, via over it. And maybe you need a sudoers file if your hook, like this hook doesn't uh, call any external method, uh, like external command. But if you're calling external command, you need sudoers file to enable it. And uh, just a make file uh, to install the hook. So basically, these all uh, exist in the VDSM source code. You can see there's a VDSM hooks directory, and you can look at the different hooks and see how they do it and just take inspiration from there. So that's it about hooks. <coughs> Let's talk a bit about scheduling API. So basically, hooks is just extending one single host, and you, it's a very flexible mechanism. You can change the entire way the VM is started. What we need to remember, hooks, 
because of their flexibility, they can also not run because if they're not installed on the host, then the hook will not run and it doesn't matter that you specify the custom parameters. So it's kind of like a um, at your own risk uh, mechanism. Um, and that's affecting the VM lifecycle. Scheduling API, this is how we can change how the engine actually starts the VMs on which host it selects to start the VM. So basically the need was because uh, users wanted to do some uh, specific scheduling and there was no specific scheduling done. You, you couldn't choose like where, which host would start the VM. There were just a few basic algorithms that didn't take into consideration like user requests, like uh, someone wanted a maximum of three VMs per host. He couldn't do that. So the old scheduling mechanism basically it just had uh, like uh, one uh, distribution algorithm that is based on CPU load only, and it would basically either evenly distribute the VMs by CPU load, so it looked, okay, this host has 10% uh, and this 50, so I will put it on this host to have like 50% CPU, and it has some uh, logic like that. Or power saving, it tried to condense all the VMs on the host uh, which are more, more used by CPU, and to reduce CPU usage on other hosts. Um, and the scheduling itself of the VMs to, to select which host to use, it was just basic uh, modules that are hard coded. So the VM needs to have the devices and it needs to have uh, the host, sorry. It needs to have uh, like uh, support for the devices, for the networking, for the storage. It needs to have enough memory available and so on. And uh, load balancing is a periodical task that uh, was running and also like trying to balance according to the distribution algorithm. It also didn't have too much extendability. So basically all, this whole mechanism wasn't like uh, extensible by the user. So the new mechanism actually changes the entire picture. So we have a scheduling policy, which is, you, which is a policy that you select per cluster level. And on this scheduling policy, you can put filter modules, so filtering uh, for the host that we select. Wait modules that are just if you have a couple of hosts left that it decides which host is the best. And load balancing module, which decides how to actually do load balancing when you have uh, hosts that are already running the VMs. <coughs> All external models are developed by, uh, in Python, so user can just write his own models. And the existing logic, it was also trans translated to models, just built-in models that you can use. Um, and as I said, we can set the desired policy. You can find more information, uh, just a list of existing uh, policy units that you can, uh, it's like uh, samples that you can look and uh, write your own policy units uh, according to these samples. And there's also a wiki page about it, just explaining you how to write uh, uh, external scheduling modules. So let's look at how it actually works. We have a list of hosts in the beginning, and then we have the filter module running. So each filter module filters out one or more hosts, or maybe no hosts, just passes all hosts uh, next. And when we have more than one host left, then we have the wait module that is running and just decides to give some scores for the host and the host with the lowest score wins and this is the one that gets selected to run the VMs. Let's see how we can write a filter module. Basically, <coughs> filter module just uh, filters out host. It's uh, easy, easy logic. It has a set, um, set API that we need to implement. Uh, and we don't know, like, uh, yeah. Uh, we don't know in each order each filter module is kind of atomic. It doesn't know what ran before it. It wouldn't know what runs after it. But we do chain them up, like there is a set uh, filtering chain. Um, and uh, of course, the existing logic still exists. You can still use it. We'll see later how we can mix the, the existing and the external models that a user can write. So let's say we want this filter to run, uh, to filter out hosts that uh, have more than three VMs running already. So I know it's kind of hard to read, 
but uh, I'll just explain what are the different uh, parts. So the first part is class definition in Python. It defines the name of the filtering module. It also sets, like if we have a weight module or load balancing module, this will be the name of all those modules. And each kind of module is just uh, a method that we need to implement with the set API. So in this case, the do filter method, it accepts the host IDs, just a list of the hosts that it needs to filter out, and the VM ID that we need to run, and the custom arguments uh, map that also can be sent from the engine as we've seen, uh, like uh, custom properties for the filter. And then these properties, we can define some validation on them. So in this case, uh, maximum VM count is a property that is a number. And in the code, we get actually the property from the, from the map, if it exists. If it doesn't, there's some default value. And the actual filtering is, uh, as I said, uh, you need sometimes the Python SDK. So in this case, we create a API, a proxy to the API object. We do a query on the host, and then we do the filter, filtering logic on this host uh, according to, uh, in this case, how much VMs are already running on each host. So we need to get this information and filter upon it. And in the end, we just print the list of the IDs, and this list is what's passed on to the next filter. Uh, so basically, filtering module uh, it's the same for weight module, just some different uh, method that we need to implement. And the same for load balancing module is also a method. So we can have a file with one module or we can have a file with uh, all the modules implemented. And then ju there's some just logic that this module does, each module does. Uh, and this all goes into an external policy unit. So basically, there's some process running on a library on the engine, and it analyzes the filters, the weights, the balance functions, finds them, creates uh, model representations to use in the engine, and uh, just can, it can be used in the engine, so we'll see how to use it. We have this configuration screen. It's kind of huge, so I zoom in a bit. So we can use for uh, this policy unit, we can decide which filtering models we use. So we have the set ones, which do are not marked as external, and some external model that we created, for example, this max VMs module. And we also can decide which weight uh, modules we want to use. So we can use the existing ones, or we can use the external ones that we have. Doesn't necessarily have to be like from the same file. It can be like different file in this case. Even VM distribution is something different. And load balancing also, we can uh, decide which load balancing logic we want in this uh, cluster policy. And this basically is the cluster policy that we apply per cluster. So this cluster can have one cluster policy that decides inside how to do the filtering, how to do the weight, and how to do the load balancing. And as I said, we have the custom properties that we need to specify. In this case, I can set like I want a maximum of two VMs. Okay, I don't have to set three, and this satisfies the use the user's uh, use case. So, Rene, your I plugins. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Mike. I will I will now talk about uh, UI plugins. Um, UI plugins is an infrastructure to extend the Oviat web admin interface. It was introduced in Oviat release 3.2. Um, I will give you a short overview about the UI plugins. If you need uh, further or more detailed information, please check out the Oviat wiki. And also have a look at the real world examples that you get a feeling what can you do with uh, UI plugins or which UI plugins already exist. Yeah, um, this is the, the web admin user interface you are normally working with, and you can e extend this interface by um, creating custom buttons, for example, um, creating different tabs, and um, yeah, write your code for this um, for this um, object. 
um, what, you, what do you need to do to create a UI plugin? You first have to create a plugin host page. This is the page that um, uh, holds the actual, um, the actual JavaScript code and a plugin descriptor, which is a configuration file and includes some uh, metadata. Uh, this is important for the UI plugins and you can, ha can override it on a user level if you want to. Um, let's have a look at a very, very simple plugin. As you can see, it's um, basic HTML code and the JavaScript section. Um, one important thing to know about UI plugins is that plugins are executed in an iframe. So um, you, f you have, uh, first of all, you have to, to access the plugin API from the iframe. Um, you are net then calling the API register uh, function to register the plugin event handler. And in this example, we are adding a new main tab. Um, the, the label of the main tab is foo tab and it will display the website foo.com uh, in, in this tab. Um, and with api.ready, API we are telling the plugin that the tab can be displayed. Um, as, I, as I said before, you can add uh, main tabs and sub tabs. Um, this would be a custom main tab and a sub tab appears if you select, for example, a host or a virtual machine or a data center or a cluster. Um, you can set the tab content URL and decide if it should be accessible for all users or, for, or just for a specific user group. Um, next, you can, you can add buttons. These are main buttons um, where you can decide should they be only in the toolbar, should they be in the context menu, or should they be in both. Um, you can show dialogues, uh, uh, open dialogues. These dialogues have the same look and feel as over it with the show dialogue option. You set the dialogue content URL and can close it, of course. Um, and you can deal with, uh, with logged-in users. Um, yeah, but the important events, the U UI in it for initializing it and uh, selection the selection change events. For example, you have a plugin uh, or a UI sub-tab uh, for virtual machines, and if a user uh, chooses uh, selects another virtual machine, you obviously have to change the, the code or the behavior of your subtype or what, what are you displaying in it. That's done with the um, selection change uh, events. You can react on user logins and user logouts, and uh, you can uh, send messages uh, from, the, from the plugin using the HTML5 uh, post message API. Um, yeah, that was a short overview about uh, the JavaScript code. Let's have a look at the, at the metadata and the default configuration. Um, you have to put it in a JSON file, which is located in the user share over at engine slash UI plugins. Um, it's important that you have a unique name, so each U UI plugin needs a unique name and an URL, the URL uh, points to the web page which uh, hosts the JavaScript code. And you, you can optionally um, pass in some config um, options. Uh, to summarize, you have to write the plugin descriptor, the plugin host page, and then see your plugin in action. It's quite simple. I will now, now show you a real world example that you can have a, a feeling for what can I do with UI plugins. It's a monitoring UI plugin uh, written by me. It's hosted on GitHub, so, so check it out. Uh, what it does is it displays uh, check results from Isinga or Nagios or other forks um, in the web admin interface. Um, as, you, as you can see here, um, we have a new sub-tab named Monitoring Details. 
And in this example, I selected one of the virtual machines, and in this uh, monitoring detail subtab, you see all the uh, host and service checks. Yeah, thanks. So we have all the, the host and service checks plus a few details on this tab. Okay, so next um, you can also um, show your PMP for Nagios performance uh, data with it. In this example, we have the, the ping times for, for the ping check of a virtual machine displayed. Um, all this is done using the UI plugin infrastructure for sure, so I created a, a, the subtabs. Um, all the code to communicate with Isinga is done in Perl. I, I use the IDEO database of Isinga of Nagios, or, or if you want to the MKLF status API. Then I have the template toolkit, jQuery, jQuery UI, uh, for uh, displaying the results. So the look and feel is nearly like over it, and it's all done in, with jQuery and with CSS. And yeah, I have also included auto tools for configure, make, make installs, spec files, and a SL Linux policy for it. Um, I know it's very, it's not that big, sorry, but the plugin descriptor is yeah the, the same as seen in the in the example before. We have an URL and a name, and config options. And in the config options, I have the um, location of the CGI files, as I used uh, Perl for it, there's the location for the CGI files. Um, for, the, for the actual code, um, yeah, this API.add um, subtab, I'm adding the, the subtabs um, for, for data centers, clusters, hosts, storage domains, and so on. And yeah, sending a get variable to the CGI scripts that the scripts are aware of uh, what a type of uh, result should be displayed. Um, if you select another data center, another host, um, it's done with the, um, yeah, the data set center selection change option, for example, uh, which, which passes the name of the new data center to the CGIs. Um, as, we are as we were talking about monitoring, I just want to introduce another project um, done by us. It's a monitoring plugin for Isinga and Nagios written in Perl, where you can monitor all your data centers, clusters, host, virtual machines, and so on. It's written in, yeah, in, in Perl, as I like Perl, and it uses the REST API Mike int introduced before. Yeah, if you, if you have um, questions, you can ask them now. You please, check, please also check out the Ovid, um wiki for more information. Uh, join the mailing list or um, yeah, join us on our IRC. Um, thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, thanks, guys. Thanks.